KTSN's Motoring 95 is brought to you by Quaker State. Quaker State, the intelligent oil for longer engine life. And Midas, for brake, exhaust, suspension, and steering service, trust your car to Midas. You know, it's predicted that over the next year between three and 4,000 people will be killed on Canadian highways. And that figure doesn't include the many thousands will be severely injured. And you can bet that many of these accidents will be alcohol related. It's unbelievable, isn't it, that despite stricter laws and more public awareness, these intoxicated jerks continue to get behind the wheel and either kill themselves or more than likely claim an innocent victim. But how do you stop it? Well, we could put a policeman outside of every licensed drinking establishment in the country and do breathalyzer tests, but of course, that's impossible. Well, this week we're gonna discover that, at least in the province of Ontario, many of these restaurant owners are doing their best to ensure that when their patrons leave the building, they are sober and fully comprehend that driving is not a right, but rather a privilege. To give you a little bit of background about the program, the program has come about primarily because of the large number of drink driving related accidents that have taken place on the roads in Ontario over the last number of years. Once this program becomes mandatory throughout the entire province, you will have to prove that you have uh, received your certificate in this program in order to work in a licensed establishment in Ontario. It's early morning. The restaurant will not open for several hours, yet the entire service staff is on hand. They're here to learn more about a program that deals with the product they sell and its impact on the consumer. The product is alcohol, and the program is called the Server's Intervention Program. Well, the main message that we're trying to get through is that servers of alcohol have choices in terms of how they can respond to customers uh, and to develop their awareness level around those choices and their confidence level in delivering information to customers. It seems that today we have a responsibility of educating our customers about what they can and cannot do in a licensed establishment. If you allow someone onto a licensed premise and they're already intoxicated and you allow them to stay there, you accept full liability for their intoxication, even though you didn't serve them any alcohol. So it's your responsibility to intervene very quickly and get them off the premises. They are the people at the front line. They're the people who are meeting the customers on a day-to-day -day basis, one-to-one. -one. They have the most contact with our, our patrons, and uh, certainly they do have the most responsibility there. Jack Brewer has been in the restaurant business for over 15 years and his staff has taken the server's intervention program. He believes the program is a good one, but... It's unrealistic to think that the world is going to be politically correct on this program. It's just the world just doesn't work that way. It's nice to say, okay, the positive sides are just that, you know, it's the awareness from the server's point of view of what they should do. But on the... Uh, the other side, it looks to me like it's just not a real world. It's just, it's just not going to uh, uh, work the way it's supposed to. But it does teach them how to uh, um, have the awareness level. That's all I can see. I've been bartending about 22 years, and I did take it. I didn't really change a lot of my thinking. Uh, I think it's common sense, uh, you know, like you just don't overserve people. I think people should take a little responsibility for themselves. If a waiter or waitress came up to you and said, you've had enough, we can't serve you anymore, what would your reaction be? My reaction would be, well, it would depend how I was feeling. If I felt okay, my accent would, I'd be upset. But uh, if, if I thought I could drink some more, I'd leave and go to another bar. Well, I remember one time, uh, uh, this is going back four or five years ago, when everybody took the course and we all did it one day and one afternoon. Well, then they were going around telling people they were drinking too much or having too much, and then they, they were cut off. Well, you just can't do that because, I mean, that happens not only in a place like this, that could happen in a, a fine dining restaurant once a person has more than one bottle of wine. It's your job to make that person have a good time 
it's your job to make sure he doesn't go in a car and kill somebody that night because you've overserved him. The real world is, is what we do and this is what people do and if it's not here it'll be somewhere else. We're getting stricter and uh, I think the younger people coming up have lived with it whereas the older people have a tough time accepting it because they didn't grow up with it. But uh, I know for sure that uh, more people are finding other ways of traveling. Like that bartender said, you have to be responsible for your own actions. If you can't or won't, society should do it for you. I'll be back later on Kenzie's Corner. Test Drive with Graham Fletcher. This white stuff is the bane of the motoring public. Well, it's not going to put the bite on this edition of Test Drive as we take a look at the Canadian-built Chevrolet Lumina a car that has seen more input from customers and dealers alike than any other Chevrolet ever built. The input from customers, prospective customers and dealers resulted in 120 changes being made within the last year. One of the changes for the better is the fact that the new Lumina now uses a tandem wiper system rather than the opposed type found in the old car. The result is better forward visibility in poor weather because you now no longer have the large section of unwiped windshield immediately below the interior mirror. As I say, a move for the better. The single biggest improvement on this Lumina is the fact that GM have taken the seat belt off the door and put it on the B pillar and added an adjustable upper anchor. This accomplishes two things. First of all, the adjustable anchor allows the seat belt to fit a variety of different people properly. And secondly, and perhaps more importantly, it eliminates the age-old aggravation with luminous of the past, and that was the fact that the belt always rested across the side of your neck or your face. The suspension is fully independent and comprised of McPherson struts all round with anti-roll bars both back and front. Our tester came with the upgraded wheel package which includes a huge set of P22560 R16 Goodyears. During the pylon test this car performed admirably, easily outperforming most of its competition. During moments of exuberance the rear end actually started to break away. Now this is nothing to get worked up over because the action is fairly benign. Five lateral cross members provide a great deal of structural integrity and rigidity. This stiffer platform helps things enormously. On the road, the larger tyres impart a somewhat harsh ride. That said, it is not what could be described as uncomfortable. If ride comfort is, however, your priority, stick with the base tyres. They offer a more compliant ride. The 3100 V6 engine produces 160 horsepower, which is 20 more than last year. Combine this with the 185 pounds feet of torque and the Lumina moves along very nicely. Worthy of note is that this engine is appreciably quieter, more fuel efficient and offers better idle quality than its predecessor. A characteristic I'm not overly fond of is the early tip-in point that GM seems to favour. From a standstill the slightest movement of the gas pedal moves the car. The drawback being that in stop and go traffic the pedal is just too sensitive. The other drawback is that the top end of the rev range suffers because the emphasis has been placed on the low end. My gripes aside, this engine is still one of the better V6s around. For the record, the Lumina accomplished the 0 to 100k dash in about 11 seconds. Match with this engine is a smooth shifting electronic 4 speed automatic. The fact that the engine and transmission communicate with each other via the powertrain control module means that the tranny is always in step with the engine. The rework on the Lumina interior has been done very well. The radio falls readily to hand despite being below the heater controls. Heater controls themselves are of the rotary variety and the buttons have been rubberized to make them easier to use with gloves on. They've also incorporated the rear defroster into the center of this switch. That eliminates the need for a secondary control. The dash, well it's analog, very legible, and if you go with the LS sedan, as we've got, you get a tack as well as the usual gauges. On the left side you've got the power mirrors, locks and windows. In short, the ergonomics have been improved dramatically. Other standard equipment on the Lumina LS includes cruise control, a power trunk release and two coffee cup holders up front. The front seats are form-fitting and comfortable despite being a 60-40 split bench. In the rear the occupants are treated to ample head and leg room and yes, the seat will accommodate three across. 
The trunk is large, deep and well laid out, meaning it will accommodate a family's worth of luggage with ease. The other item that impresses is the level of hush. This car is much quieter than its predecessor. Stopping power is supplied by a front disc rear drum setup that comes complete with GM's award-winning Delco 6 ABS system. During the brake test, I required just 118 feet to stop from 80K. While there is nothing to complain about when it comes to brake performance, there certainly is when it comes to pedal feel. Simply stated, it is very spongy imparting a degree of numbness I just do not like. This is the one spot that needs improving. On the safety front, the Lumina scores well with standard ABS, dual airbags and adjustable upper seatbelt anchors. Noteworthy is the fact that the Lumina is built exclusively in Oshawa, Ontario. The nice part being that the quality of the fit and finish bears out the slogan on the sticker. Well that's it for this edition of Test Drive. You know the improvements GM have made to this new Lumina are significant which means their share of the very lucrative family car market should be maintained. Now that marketplace is very important because believe it or not 30% of all passenger cars sold in North America are of this variety. So this car is very important to GM. Hey. You know, when you drop into a gas station these days, you'll usually find more than just gas being offered, as alternative fuels are becoming more popular with motorists. Well, recently, we had a chance to spend some time with a natural gas-powered vehicle. And we also talked to a Canadian auto magazine who did extensive tests on this van to try and determine whether natural gas is really a viable alternative. We'll have that story next week. Now let's head to the garage and join Bill Gardner. Now, on last week's show, we showed you a starter motor actually installed in a vehicle up on the hoist. You could actually see the starter motor jumping in and cranking that engine over. This week, we want to look at starters a little bit further, and I want you to think about the mechanical advantage that the starter needs to have in order to crank over that massive engine in your vehicle. Now, we've got that actual starter motor that was in the pickup truck we showed you on the hoist cranking over last week. This is the armature out of that starter motor and this starter motor is what we refer to as a direct drive starter. In other words, every revolution of the armature in this starter motor produces one revolution of the little pinion gear that's trying to crank the engine over. Now that pinion gear meshes with the uh, the teeth on the ring gear right here and its entire mechanical advantage over the engine comes from the size relationship of this tiny pinion gear to this huge gear on the flywheel. Now while there's still a lot of full-size vehicles being cranked by a direct drive starter motor like this, there's an awful lot more vehicles each and every year that are being cranked over by what we refer to as a gear reduction starter motor. Now when I talk about gear reduction I want you to think about a 10-speed bicycle. If you try and start that bicycle off in high gear it's really difficult for you to break away from a stop. But if you gear down to first gear, you can take that load of breaking away from a stop pretty easily. The pedals fly around easily and you're off without much resistance at all. It's the same thing for a starter motor. Now, there's nothing really new about these gear reduction starter motors. Uh, the Chrysler Corporation used them in the 60s, 70s, and 80s very extensively. And this is the drive end housing of one of their starter motors, their own design of starter motor that was used in that uh, on those vintage of cars. You can see the uh, pinion down here that meshes with the flywheel on the engine, but back inside the starter motor there's a gear right here that's going to mesh with a smaller gear on the end of the armature of the starter motor so that the armature turns at high speed and we have a reduction through here to give us an extra mechanical advantage to crank that engine over. As, as well as that mechanical advantage that takes place between the starter pinion and the flywheel. Now, this starter isn't used on any current vehicles today, but on, on today's vehicles, a lot of gear reduction starter motors are in place, and many of them use a principle we, we refer to as planetary gear set. Now, that's the uh, same type of gears that you've got in an automatic transmission to give you various forward speeds. And this tiny little Bosch gear reduction starter uses a planetary gear set. You can see the sun gear, planetary gears, and the ring gear down in here that allow that, or give that starter its, its uh, mechanical advantage over the engine. Now, this makes for a very compact design, and uh, it, it uh, gives the engineers a great flexibility in packaging the engines. There's another planetary gear set out of a starter motor. This one's broken quite badly and it won't turn, but you can see the, uh, the ring gear around the outside, the three small planetary gears, and in the middle would be the sun gear. Now, 
The Japanese use gear reduction starters on their vehicles extensively as well, and they do it a wee bit differently. Theirs, uh, their design is a little bit uh, more like the old Chrysler design in that they use straight cut gears. This small gear would be on the end of the, uh, the armature, the electric motor part of the starter. This idler gear is in between and just rests over top of a post here. And the idler gear meshes with a larger gear here on the, uh, on the drive end of the starter. And there's the pinion that meshes with the flywheel teeth of the engine right up here. So we've got several reductions in this starter in addition to that reduction we've got between the pinion and the, and the uh, ring gear. Now, what these gear reduction starter motors have done is allow engineers to still crank over a pretty high compression engine these days with a smaller, lighter, more compact starter motor, and in many cases, a much smaller diameter ring gear on the engine's flywheel. Now the only downside to these uh, gear reduction starter motors is the fact that they're much more expensive to rebuild. $150 to $200 range and up is not uncommon to rebuild one of these units. Whereas that old direct drive starter motor that I showed you earlier was a pretty simple deal for any mechanic to do on the bench himself. Even if you wanted to buy a rebuilt unit off the shelf, you were only talking in the $80 to $100 range. So things have changed in that respect. But one thing that hasn't changed is the fact that all these starter motors are not continuous duty motors. They're only intended for that short burst required to fire the engine up. So if there's a tuning problem with your engine that requires extended periods of cranking, get that fixed as soon as possible because that's really going to wear your starter motor. If the engine's in good shape, in many cases the starter motor will last the entire life of the vehicle. Till next week, I'm Bill Gardner for Motoring 95. A small plot of land that sits beside Skydome in Toronto was the place used to launch the Hummer in Canada. The location was also used to announce the first AM general dealer north of the border. Well, it's, it's the most unique product I've ever seen. Um, when I saw the promotional literature at a Detroit Auto Show a few years ago, the vehicle has capabilities, four-wheel drive capabilities that nothing else has. To begin with, it's an all-aluminum body. Um, that's derived again uh, from the, civilian, uh, the military application, uh, so it'll never rust or corrode. Uh, Four-wheel disc brakes, uh, the ability to climb a 60-degree uh, front slope, 40-degree side slope, uh, the ability to ford almost four feet of water. Um, it, it's general mean look on the street. It's a very stable vehicle, very safe. It's, it's um, held together. The body, for example, is a unique design. It's held together both with uh, rivets, 2,800 rivets, as well as glued. So it has a very high-tech content to it, uh, longevity. The U.S. Army has determined that its life and their purposes is 20 years. So we anticipate the average Canadian retail or commercial buyer to get 40 to, 40 to 60 years of life out of it. The first thing that strikes you about the Hummer is its sheer size and the presence it has on the road. Having said that, five minutes behind the wheel and the size becomes surprisingly manageable despite the fact that the Hummer is a full 10 inches wider than a full-size Chevy pickup. The reason for the extreme width is the fact that the entire drivetrain sits up between the driver and passenger for improved ground clearance. To get the drive shafts up and out of the way as well, the Hummer uses a clever set of reduction gears at each wheel. The resulting 16 inches of ground clearance makes this vehicle all but unstoppable. The driving position is also remarkably civilized given the nature of the vehicle. The other thing that surprises is the level of standard equipment. There's a full slate of analog gauges, power windows, locks and mirrors, a decent radio and of course air conditioning. The drawback is that the ergonomics at play here are a dead loss. One of the neat devices is a switch that allows you to adjust the tire pressures from inside the vehicle. On-road ride comfort is excellent. Off-road, while you don't need a kidney belt, the ride is far from refined. All in all, a very unique vehicle. The only other vehicle I have ever driven that has attracted as much attention is the Rambo Lambo, the Lamborghini LM002. Our Midas tip of the week concerns rim leaks. If you're having a problem with underinflated tires and you can't find a puncture in your tire, 
there's a real good chance that you've got a leak around the rim. Now, if it's a late model vehicle with aluminum alloy wheels like this one, there's a darn good chance you've got a lot of corrosion built up in this rim flange area. It's a very common problem. You can see it on this rim here, this roughness and chalky looking corrosion that's all around this area here is destroying that seal that's necessary between the rim flange and the bead of the tire on any tubeless tire. Now what you've got to do in order to remedy that situation is demount the tires from the rims and clean up that corrosion. Now you can see on this tire that I've used rubber buffer in this area right here to clean off that corrosion. But around the rest of the tire you can see that chalky kind of uh, dust that is formed in that area and that's affecting our seal there, causing air leakage. You've got to completely remove that and in addition you've got to sand down that corrosion that's on the rim flange. We've done this rim, the one off the other side of the same car, and you can see what we've done is sand it down and repaint that area in order to uh, make it nice and smooth. Now we can get a proper seal. Now if we're reinstalling an old tire that's very rough around the bead, it may, it may in some cases also be necessary to apply some sealant compound to this area in order to affect that proper seal. But in any case, if you're trying to live with this situation, I suggest that you get it remedied. You're certainly shortening the life of a set of tires, you're wasting fuel running on underinflated tires, and you may be compromising your own safety if those tires are drastically underinflated. That's your Midas Tip of the Week. Kenzie's Corner with Jim Kenzie. We've made some progress on drinking and driving, but we've still got a long way to go. According to the results of roadside spot checks, only a couple of percent of drivers are actually impaired, but they're involved in over one-third of all fatal crashes. But what we haven't come to grips with yet is the fact that there are two kinds of drunk drivers. The so-called social drinker, who's maybe had four beers instead of three, he may be a couple of counts over the legal limit, he shouldn't be driving for sure, but sometimes he does. Now he can be reached with usual programs like advertising, threats of enforcement, additional police spot checks. But the other kind of driver is the habitual aggressive drunk. This is the guy who's got maybe 0 .30 blood alcohol concentration. That's very nearly dead. He's got a history of drunk driving convictions, license suspensions, and statistics show that these people often have criminal records for other things like assault and weapons dangerous. Now society has to learn to treat these people not as a traffic safety problem, but as a public safety problem. These aren't simply impaired drivers, these people are sociopaths. If one of these guys gets into a car, drunk, and kills three innocent people, the court should treat him no differently than if he crawled into a bar and shot them with a gun. The weapon of choice should not make any difference. Now we have technology to keep these people from even driving their cars. We've got jail terms, permanent license suspensions, all we have to do is decide as a society, are we going to put these features into place? If I have a vote, I vote yes. I'm Jim Kenzie. Well, that's it for this week. And again, next week, we're going to talk about natural gas. Is it really a practical alternative? And we'll also discover that not all brake rotors are created equally. So stay tuned for that. And also stay tuned for our upcoming Car of the Year special in two weeks. That's it for now. We'll see you next week as we continue to bring you more stories about cars and the people who drive them. Motoring 95 is proud to introduce the first in a series of comprehensive test drive videos with an exclusive comparison of the seven most popular minivans in North America. Graham Fletcher evaluates performance, versatility and safety. Bill Gardner examines each van, top to bottom, front to back, and under the hood. Jim Kenzie covers showroom savvy, the demonstrator, buying or leasing, options, and much more. We'll also compare fuel economy, safety features, warranties, replacing parts, and recall history. For your copy of this exclusive comparison video, send check or money order to Motoring 95, P.O. Box 65213, Toronto, Ontario, M4K3Z2 or call 1-800-340-7607. 416 and 905 area codes call 416-462-1504. TSN 1504 Motoring 95 has been brought to you by Quaker State. Quaker State, the intelligent oil for longer engine life. And Midas, for brake, exhaust, suspension and steering service, trust your car to Midas.